Hello, good evening and welcome to our last news bulletin for the day. We are live from the News Hub at Adesawa in Kanda, Accra. My name is Pa Kutiasari. Coming up uh, in our headline news today. The Opposition National Democratic Congress says the PDS scandal was a grand scheme by President Akufado and his relatives to appropriate the 51% Ghanaian shareholding in PDS for themselves for the next 20 years. Now, at a media conference, General Secretary of the NDC, Johnson Isidun Ketia, dared the President to take action on the PDS scandal based on the FTI consultant report. Also, that's our voting duration for the 2020 general elections and subsequent ones may be reduced from 7 a.m. to 4 p.m. The current voting period from 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. according to the chair of the Electoral Commission, Jin Mensa, delays declaration of results and increased violence at the polling stations. She was speaking at the ECOWAS UN workshop on prevention and mitigating electoral violence in the sub-region. Elsewhere, some polling stations in the Greater Accra region are yet to receive the 2019 Provisional Register on the first day of the exhibition exercise. Now, although the exercise recorded low turnout, some other materials are yet to reach the exhibition officers at the polling stations. You're also watching News at 10. Let's find out what's coming up in international news this hour. And Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has vowed to an expat of the occupied West Bank if his return to office next week, he would apply Israeli sovereignty over the Jordan Valley and Northern Dead Sea, a policy certain to be backed by the right-wing parties whose support he would need for a coalition. Elsewhere, Rwanda has agreed to take in hundreds of African migrants who are currently being held in Libyan detention centers. A joint agreement between the governments, the UN Refugee Agency and the African Union was announced on Tuesday. An initial group of 500 people will be evacuated by plane to Rwanda in the coming weeks. And Chad's parliament has voted to extend a state of emergency by four months in three provinces where fighting between rival ethnic groups have surged in recent weeks. A state of emergency is in place in the western Tebesti region, bordering uh, Niger and the eastern Sila, and Wadai regions, bordering Sudan. At least 50 people were killed in clashes between uh, semi-nomadic cattle headers of President Idris Derby's Zagwawa ethnic group and settled farmers, mostly from the Odian community last month. A reminder, you're still watching News at 10 live from our news up here at Adesau in Kanda, Accra. We're streaming live on Facebook. If you've got any views or suggestions to share with us on any of our top stories this hour, feel free uh, to share them on any of our social media pages on Facebook and on Twitter. Our handle is TV3GH. Now, voting duration for the 2020 general elections and subsequent ones may be reduced from 7 a.m. to 4 p.m. The current voting period from 7 a.m. to 5 p.m., according to the chair of the Electoral Commission, Jin Mensa, delays declaration of results and increases violence at the polling stations. She was speaking at the ECOWAS UN workshop on prevention and mitigating electoral violence in the sub-region. Electoral violence has been one of the major challenges most West African countries are grappling with. Security measures are breached on the final day of voting owing to late completion of the voting time. It is against this backdrop that the ECOWAS and the UN have engaged managers of election in the sub-region to share experiences and prefer solutions for electoral violence. The chair of the Electoral Commission of Ghana, Jane Mensah, said the EC is putting in measures in advance to mitigate electoral violence in the country. We've also started early engagement with our security agencies at the highest level. We have met with the leadership of the Ghana Police Service and our discussions have centered on strengthening security ahead of election 2020. We are planning regular meetings with them and the purpose really is to tighten the loopholes 
and to adopt a common strategy well ahead of the elections. She revealed the commission is considering doing some changes in the duration of the election to boost security during elections. One of the issues that has occupied our minds is the duration of voting. Currently, voters have between 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. to cast their votes, resulting in the counting and collation of votes going well into the night. As a security measure, the Commission will discuss the idea of reducing the voting duration from 7 a.m. to 4 p.m. to allow for the counting and collation of results well before dark. The UN resident coordinator Sylvia lopez -Ikra identified some challenges that lead to violence during elections. Often the winner takes it all approach of many electoral systems is part of the problem. Those who win collect and control almost all political and financial assets, making the stakes so high that some parties and groups are ready to resort to anything, including violence, to keep or access power. The three-day workshop is on the theme, sharing experiences and good practices on the prevention and mitigation of electoral related violence. All right, so we're going to stay a while longer on this subject. It's a pretty interesting story to follow up on. Uh, we'll be joined on Skype now by Emisa Abraham, who's a lecturer at the University of Cape Coast, and he joins us live on Skype. Uh, thank you very much, sir, for your time. So the EASY's own assessment, that's the reduction in the duration, uh, you know, from 7 to 5 p.m. Now it's 7 to 4 uh, p.m., and we understand the reason for that is to reduce violence at the electoral or the polling stations, as well as to ensure that there's early counting. What do you make of this latest research? reason given by the Electoral Commission. Thank you very much for having me. Um, basically, with the reason that the EC gave, um, I doubt whether um, it is enough to just cut the time by an hour. Because um, when we talk of electoral violence, I don't see um, an extension or you know a reduce a, a reduction in the time uh, as you know solving the problem because there are there are there are there are a lot of factors now let me say that when we say that voting has ended at 4 p.m for instance it does not necessarily mean that people will not continue to vote what it means is that new people will not be allowed to join the queue and so all those people who are still in the queue will have to vote um, or, or, you know, we we'll, would we'll have to finish voting. So what it means is that it is not necessarily necessarily the case that if you extend it, if if you reduce the time, you you know, counting counting will begin during the day. There are other pertinent things that must be done. For instance, if the time is extended, it makes it makes room for. Um, other eventualities such as uh, late arrival of electoral materials, breakdown of biometric uh, machines, and and all that. And so um, I, I don't I don't really see this as an apt decision that can actually curb electoral violence. Especially since uh, the normal 7 to 5 p.m., we still have people uh, standing in long queues awaiting their turn to vote. This certainly will not resolve the problem, as you just said. Yes, definitely. Because what 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 normally happens is that um, early in the morning you have a lot of people join the queue so that they will go vote and then go do their own businesses. And then you know after after three, you still find people who who actually went to work who had then been allowed by the employers to now go and vote also joining the queue. So I'm wondering how how you know those people will be factored in especially when it is not necessarily a statutory holiday that you know a, a private employer can just allow an employee to just go and vote and you know go and be in the queue for four hours or three hours just to vote and so i think that the ec must really you know discuss discuss this in detail and then find out the other 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 alternatives that 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 can be used you don't seem convinced by the reasons uh, given uh, by the Electoral Commission uh, for wanting to uh, reduce the time from 7 to, to 4 p.m. But let's move on. 
many have also said that, for instance, one of the things the Electoral Commission should be looking at is in you know, bringing forward the date for voting, uh, that's to November 7 instead of December 7. Are you one of those who hold that strong view? Exactly, exactly. That is, that is, that is a very good proposal uh, uh, because normally uh, most of our elections have gone to a runoff and when it so happens, you realize that um, 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 it delays the, it delays, it, it, you know, the, the, the time for transition is very, is very, you know, small. And so we don't really have much, much things being discussed. And again, when you look at, for instance, um, I'm, I'm in the university and when it, when it gets to run off, we see how students will have to now go back and go vote and all that. And all these step step uh, you know a lot of things and so that that proposal is actually a good one but to reduce the electoral period that is the time for voting by one hour for the purposes of cabin security and electoral violence definitely does not really fit I want to say a big thank you to you. Uh, Kwa Kweja is a uh, lecturer in the University of Cape who's joining us uh, to do some analysis on the back of the Electoral Commission's uh, latest um, resolve to uh, reduce the electoral time uh, from 7 uh, to 4 p.m. You're still watching news at 10 live from our news hub here at Adesau in Kanda. We're going to go for a short break. When we return, we've got more stories. Right, welcome back to News at 10 live from our new tab here at Adesau in Kandakra. Now, the Forestry Commission is seeking financial clearance from the Finance Ministry to recruit 1,000 forest and wildlife guards. It is also going through procurement processes to enable it to procure 1,000 guns to arm its guards. My colleague Peter Kwaodato reports the moves by the Commission is in response to the growing threat from illegal lumberers and poachers. Ghana has 21 protected areas, which include seven national parks, six resource reserves, five coastal wetlands, four wildlife sanctuaries, and one strict nature reserve. The conservation, regulation of utilization, administration, protection, and management of forest and wildlife resources are the sole mandate of the Forestry Commission, with the current staff strength of 4,300 nationwide. 1,298 of the staff are guards deployed in the 21 protected areas nationwide. The Mole National Park alone covers an area of 4,840 square kilometers protected savanna and forest areas, 1,555 square kilometers, more than the size of the Greater Accra region, which is 3,245 square kilometers. Ironically, biodiversity in the Mole National Park is protected by a handful of guards due to limited staff, impacting negatively on efficiency and effectiveness. That park there is bigger than Greater Accra. How do you get about, say, 30 people, 20 people to parade and, and to watch that? How do you do that? It is not easy for us. And like I've said, people have been shot and killed at the peril of their lives protecting the forest. The Forestry Commission says the only way to improve protection of the wildlife and forest resources is by increasing the staff strength of its protection unit. I need 1,000 people to be employed to help us in the job that we've done. We've written to the, the Minister of Finance to give us clearance. I'm awaiting for a response from the Ministry. Uh, indeed, we, we need about 3,000 for a compliment, but I'm asking for 1,000 now. If we are able to get the clearance, it will also help in a big way by reducing the, the challenges that we have. Chief Executive Officer Kujo Sofri further defended the rationale behind the decision to arm the forest and wildlife guards. Just within three months, two of our people have been shot dead. The last one received about five hours or so surgery at Interbetan. I would not want to send an army to war and tie their hands at their backs. He urged the public, particularly those living close to any of the protected areas, to own the resources and support the commission to deliver. 
Now, Egyptian hospital contractors working on the 60-bed Tepa District Hospital have revealed that a government forensic audit commissioned into their project has not indicted them in of any wrongdoing. Now, Eurojet the Invest, the main contractor for the project, says apart from the audit, government's delay in giving them tax waivers and exemptions is to blame for the 2018 deadline not being met. The Sicano Sebi and yet NDC for dia and then MPP for dia taxpayers' money. Now, Messre MPP near DC now said Sadia Rudia come me in free horn. MPP Shasia and DC bar on personal betras. And this is so Shasia and people in so bounce on personal betras. Now, as I said, we said, I am you know, man who you are a set of man in your national policy. And who said, I deal with ya. Me MPP about me and NDC about also about Baba Trust. An unhappy chief, the Teba Paramount, regrets politicians spend so much on state resources all in the name of projects and later leave them uncompleted. Construction of the Teba District Hospital started in 2015 with the deadline of 2018 for construction to end. A visit to the site shows some completed structures of the main wards with a focus on bungalows, the radioactive department, stores, mortuary and other essential departments are all receiving a facelift. The deadline has not been met and the contractors have justified the delay blaming government. One of the major issues is with the tax exemptions, but uh, it takes time to, to solve it with the parliament and the ministry of health, but now it's solved it and now we're okay. We are getting the tax exemptions and now we are delivering most of the foreign materials, mm. like uh, 85% 80, of the materials, foreign materials is, is uh, delivered to Ghana already and on site. Most of it is on site. Mm -hmm. uh, the next month we start the, the, the installation for all the medical furnitures, mm -hmm. all the medical training. Government after 2017 halted some hospital projects under construction for a forensic audit to be conducted. The contractors say the audit did not find them culpable. Did the forensic audit done by the government indict you in any way? No. Uh, for for us, for us, we don't have a problem with the with the side team, as I told you. Mm -hmm. The pro of course, maybe there is some things with the top high mm -hmm. management, but. We didn't hear about this one. It was okay. With a renewed spirit and governments granting a tax waiver and exemptions to the Eurojet group, the contractor says a first quarter of 2020 deadline cannot be missed as work is 80% complete. Members of the Minority Health Committee of Parliament on a fact-finding mission expressed concern over the commitment to stick to the terms of the contract with a failed audit mission. Let us not go back. Anybody who is doing this, let's try to punish the person for the wrong thing he's doing so that it will serve as deterrent to anybody who has any intention of repeating same. But what we do normally is that today MPP is in government. The moment we have any negative news about MPP, we rush into NDC and go and find same in NDC to come and equalize. And once you do that, what happens is that tomorrow when I come, I'll come and do the same and we'll run to MPP to go and find some to come and equalize. And he is uh, very emphatic on the fact that uh, by, by uh, March 2020, the project will be handed over back to government for the people of Tepa to enjoy the health delivery they have been seeking for for the past years. The first quarter of 2020, they would have handed over. Komla Kluche, TV3 News, Tepa. Away from Tepa, drivers and traders at Dom Kwabenya continue to suffer as a result of the dusty and poor road condition. Our reporter Joseph Armstrong visited the area to report on the current situation from the ground. This is one out of many roads that drivers and traders that transport foodstuffs from their villages to the capital city go through every day. Here at Kwabenya, this is a major road that drivers travel on anytime they want to get to the capital city. On my left is called ACP, right from the Kwabena Junction here towards our end. The road is very bad. And then on my right is a road that drivers can easily use to get to Ashaiman. Unfortunately, it's also another very bad road. And right behind me 
is a road that drivers have to travel on to get to Domi and later mile 7. Unfortunately, it's equally bad. But I'm going to engage with the drivers and some of the traders here to share with me the ordeal they have to go through every day, especially people who sell food stuff. to hire papa. So we are just out there at Katasu, and I said, "Me, I was saying, me from go at see from move fast." And yes, I'm foot wrong. I can't get in fat. A higher dream or hanker, so I'm more way. Are we not part of the government? I just have what is here. He used to pass here every day and look look at our road. Frank, applying on this road is very bad. It's very very bad, and we are pleading to the government to do something about it. I can't get in any kula. Me and me too are dear. Semetu to buy any sell blue or private care mukra now pesco to be a one more dear and come out sipe no be a tipa besin chemu and foot to a dear chin and cry and a buna bem and it's all to buy and call by Ali. No two canoe. It's a quani de foot to a new queen and pa bedroom may be coffee. Near one yena, you foot to say, your son is here. We are quite Tell me, how is it affecting your movements? It's very, very dangerous. And yet, I dear buoni pakra. Because even so, don't mean quite twenty speed kilometer. I will cry so. This I will not book all because who speed car na car never say. I just say, you hear about this or be bad. Now car is so. Any of them we cry no dangerous no. The past board thing. Oh, until we fast now. That's how we watch when say be able speed car na masa. Any easy. So you can imagine if even the tipper truck driver has difficulties plying this road. I wonder what the smaller cars. We'll be going through. You can imagine preparing Banku uh, having to cover part of it so that the dust do not enter into the Banku that she's preparing for the general public to eat. And as you heard her, she complains that people refuse to buy her food because of the dust that has taken over her business. And she's afraid very soon she'll be out of business. We'll be on this road until something practicably is done about this place. From here at Kabinia, my name is Joseph Armstrong reporting for TV3. And in the studios of TV3, my name is Pa Kwesiasari. Now, the government delegation that traveled to Qatar following the power distribution services scandal has confirmed that Al Quds, the company that allegedly issued demand guarantees for the takeover of ECG, did not have the financial capabilities to do so. Now, according to the delegation's report cited by TV3, the total net worth of Al Quds is $170 million and could not underwrite a transaction which was about $350 million dollars. My colleague Martin Asiri Data has more. The latest development raises further questions regarding why such a basic requirement was not met before government handed over the electricity company of Ghana, ECG, to PDS. The government delegation was made up of Ambrose Derry, Interior Minister, Godfred Dame, Deputy Attorney General and Minister of Justice, ACP Frederick Ajay, Head of Interpol, CID Ghana Police Service, Chief Superintendent Regina Enchiwa Tenge, Head of Financial Forensics Unit, CID Ghana Police Service, and Ofuchu Tete Kujoji, Special Advisor to the Minister of Finance. Upon arrival, the Ghanaian delegation met with senior management of Alkut, which is an insurance and reinsurance company. At the said meeting, the executives of Alkut said, they had no knowledge of any such agreement between them and PDS. They further indicated that the company is not authorized to issue demand guarantees. It does not have the mandate to engage in counterparty and trade risk contracts which involve the issuance of demand guarantees. This is borne out of their constitutive documents and financial statements. When they were asked about their employee, Yaya Al-Nuri, whose signature was on the demand guarantees issued by their company, the al Qut executives said he had no authorization to commit the company financially to any transaction of big value. The highest he could authorize was $15,000. They said any big value transaction of such nature needed the approval of the board of directors, adding that al Qut has an underwriting policy and guidelines which requires the approval of the Central Bank of Qatar. No such approval was granted by the Bank of Qatar. Al-Nuri has since been suspended pending the outcome of investigations. 
Al-Qud said the alleged PDS demand guarantees valued at $350 million was about 200% the size of its entire net worth, which currently stands at $170 million. Our probe continues. In a related development, the Opposition National Democratic Congress says a PDS scandal was a grand scheme by President Kufuado and his relatives to appropriate the 51% Ghanaian shareholding in PDS for themselves for the next 20 years. Now, at a media conference, General Secretary of the NDC, John Sisiri Nketiah, dared the President to take action on the PDS scandal based on the FTI consultant report. The NDC said the finance minister, Ken Ufuriata, directed lawyer Akutu Ampao to consolidate the 51% Ghanaian shareholding under a so-called special purpose vehicle to allow for other so-called Ghanaian investors to acquire shares in PDS. According to the NDC, this meant GTS Power Limited, Santa Power Limited, and TG Energy Solutions Limited surrendering their shares to a new entity. The biggest opposition party stated the finance minister justified his directive on the grounds that it would protect and preserve the indigenous ownership stake in PDS. That this excuse is a fallacy. If we may ask, what is Ken Ufuriata's locus and authority to give such a directive? Because PDS now, with the foreign uh, shareholders and the local Ghanaian shareholders put together, still remain a private company. And there is no indication that government has any shares in PDS. Johnson Esiedu Nkatia explained the meeting to change the bank guarantee to insurance guarantee was chaired by Vice President Dr. Mahmoud Baumia. The FTI consultancy report makes a startling revelation of a meeting held on February 19, 2019. At this meeting, attended by the Vice President Dr. Baumia, the Finance Minister Kenufuriata, ECG Board Chairman Kelly Gajepo, MIDA Board Chairman Martin Eson Benjamin, and representatives of PDS. Final approval was given to PDS to change the requirement of a demand guarantee or a letter of credit from a bank into a demand guarantee from an insurance company. You can be guaranteed that you've not heard the last of the story. That's how we conclude news at 10. It came to you live from our studios here at Adesawa in Kanda Accra. For more stories, you can log on to our website, www.3news.com. My name is Pa Kwesi Asari.